Today is March 5th, 2021, and my guest is journalist and author Megan McArdle. This is Megan's fifth appearance on Econ Talk. She was here last in October of 2017 to talk about internet shaming, unfortunately a very prescient conversation. Our topic for today is the pandemic and the issue of preparedness for the next big thing. We're going to draw loosely on a recent piece Megan wrote in the Washington Post, which we will link to. Megan, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me. Always an honor. A few housekeeping matters. Uh, I want to remind listeners we are now posting video versions of Econ Talk on YouTube, so you can watch this conversation if you prefer. We also have a Goodreads group for discussing books that get talked about on Econ Talk, and I'm going to be uh, we're going to be trying some new style of styles of interviews in an upcoming episode. At least we hope Megan and I are going to talk about a book by Roger Scruton called Where We Are. Roger Scruton passed away last year, but his book struck me as an important contribution to the question of who we are, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well. I thought it would be a great conversation. So she and I are going to talk about that uh, in a few months or weeks. We'll see. But if you want to read that book in advance, uh, feel free to do so. Okay, let's get started. Now, Megan, we are somewhere near the one-year anniversary of the pandemic. Of course, it's kind of hard to define the first start of it uh, around mid-March last year is when I noticed that life was grinding to some kind of halt and we were in a lot more trouble than we thought we, than I had thought we were. Um, and you recently, reflecting back on what's happened in the last year, you wrote this, uh, the column was published on February 24th, 2021. You wrote the following. After every crisis, there comes a moment of dazzling hindsight. We look back at the before time and list the things that should have been done differently. There's always something, and usually more than one something, many of them even plausible. One wonders if, say, the worst of the global financial crisis might have been averted if U.S. and European regulators had required financial institutions to hold more assets in reserve, or about all sorts of points where the pandemic might have gone very differently, or how Texas might have fared the past two weeks if power companies had invested in the kind of de-icing equipment used in Minnesota or if the state had just been plugged into an interstate grid. But wondering is easy. So is spinning counterfactuals when you already know which unlikely disaster befell you. And you, my first question for you is, what's wrong with that? Isn't that how we learn? We look back, we see what mistakes we made, and we, we intend at least going forward not to make those same mistakes in the future. Um, yes, to a point. Right. And so what what was actually top of mind when I wrote that was not even the pandemic. It was the Texas disaster, because, of course, you had it. and you all of these power plants had failed. Water had failed. And all of these people were. Well, it started with conservatives complaining that it was all about wind turbines and, you know, yeah. the environmentalists got us into this. And in fact, wind turbines were a disproportionate part of the problem. But if you drive in through the northern Midwest, there's loads of wind turbines. They have de-icing equipment um, that keep this from being a problem. So Texas didn't have that equipment. And naturally, of course, the um, the left fired back and said, well, you know, if you didn't have this deregulation and if, if Texas people had invested rather than just like deregulating and always racing to the bottom with cost provisions, then this wouldn't have happened. And in some sense, that's true. But Texas is going to invest in a lot of de-icing equipment. I mean, this was a freak storm. And, um, you know, it was a, well, a freak <laughs> long period of, of low temperatures, right? It was, this was not, maybe this is going to be the new normal. Maybe climate change is, has brought us to this point, but it hadn't happened before. Even in 2009, when there had been bad storms, it hadn't gotten that cold for that long. Um, and so, you know, Minnesota doesn't, design its power plants as Texas does to shed heat because Minnesota doesn't worry about the 120 degree days that you might get in a very hot and arid place. Um, places design for the most common problems. And that's actually like normally a good thing. We should think most about the things that are most likely to happen to us. You know, I worry more about all sorts of urban hazards like crime or getting run over by a car than I do about polar bears because it is not impossible that a polar bear could escape from the zoo and come to my house. And But it, it seems like there are a lot of other more likely threats that I would prepare for first. That said, um, 
so that runs us into a problem is that when the freak accident happens, we can look back and say, well, there was this thing we could have done, right? And we think that we would have done it. It's called hindsight bias, right? And so if you ask people, 100 people in a room about something, about an event, well, how likely something is, right? Um, and ask them to write down a prediction. And then you let them see how it plays out. And then you go back. More people will remember have, having correctly predicted that this thing was going to happen than actually um, is true. Uh, then, and that just tells us, you know, we like to think that we're in control. We like to think that we know what's going to happen, that we can prepare against all of these distant eventualities. Um, and so we kind of fool ourselves into thinking, actually, our judgment is super good. And I think one of the great things for me about having been a writer for so long um, although it's not a comfortable thing for me, is that I have written down my predictions about the True. world. And so yeah. I can go back and say, yeah, I can't smooth away um, into memory uh, and, and conveniently misremember how I felt about the, the Iraq war, how I felt about what we should do about the financial crisis and on and on and on and on and on. And in fact, I wrote a very embarrassing column about the financial crisis when the Bear Stearns collapse happened that we just, you know, maybe we'll have a garden variety rece uh, recession. Don't freak out. This is not that big a deal. We shouldn't bail them out. Well, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that that is healthy, but most people obviously don't do that. And so you end up in a place where most people think that they know better than they actually do what's going to happen in the world. But I think the, the crucial question is that, that, you know, what do we learn from? So there is hindsight bias for sure. Uh, but that's not really the focus, I think, of uh, the thrust of your piece. No, uh, that you, is you, not. <laughs> you start off, it's a good thing to observe, but you start off, I'm going to start off with what you said a minute ago. You don't spend a lot of time worrying about polar bears. There is a remote chance. That a, that a bear of some kind would wander into your uh, into your environment, and um, you know my understanding is is it's good to, to if you're attacked by a bear to make yourself as large as possible and scream. The alternative is to it, it's clearly not to run. Don't run. They run very fast. They don't yes. look fast. They run very fast. Climbing a tree is not a bad idea, but they're very tall. They can get very far up the tree while you're climbing by not uh, by just by stretching. So my understanding is if you're attacked, if you see a bear, don't run, don't freeze. If, 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 if you're attacked, make yourself as large as you can and yell back. I want to tell listeners, do not rely on that advice. That's just my, that's my, just give my, me what I got. My understanding is that it actually varies by the kind of bear. I'm sure it does. No like doubt. With grizzlies, <laughs> you just want to actually apparently play dead and hope that they kind of rip an arm off, position. get bored, and yeah. then like, um, and with some of them, you can like punch them in the nose and they'll, they, they don't like it. But I don't remember which bears are yeah. which. So, and also this could be wrong. So don't yeah. rely on that either. Yeah. Don't rely on any of this, listeners. But my point is, and bringing it up is not to pass on my deep wisdom about the Ursine uh, creatures of our world, but rather to point out that it's probably not a good investment of your time, Megan, or mine to figure out exactly. We wouldn't want to go to a couple, uh, twice a week seminar on, on bear attacks because it's very remote. And we decided that even though it's remote, even though it would be really bad, the downside's very high, we don't invest in that. If we were to be attacked by a bear and survive, we might say, well, now I'm going to take the seminar. That would also probably be an, a, a, a bad thought because it's pretty far again unlikely again um unless you thought that the probability of a bear attack had, had gotten more common so bringing us back to the the texas grid problem in the pandemic and i have to mention that i do not like Megan. i have to give you a little um hard time here i don't like the use of climate change for things that happen i don't like um to, i understand there's this argument that climate change means more variable climate and therefore, it is responsible for the eight degrees weather in Texas. But I don't know, that just kind of, I'm just kind of, I got to get that out there. I, mean, and, and, and. I, I actually, I would like to, I would like to leap on that just <laughs> as a, as an aside, leap on that aside and, and agree with it. Because I think that it's not even that it's necessarily wrong. It's that it creates the impression of a complete an utterly non-falsifiable thesis, exactly. right? Yeah. If, if the weather gets warmer, it's because of climate change. If it gets colder, it's because of climate change. If it stays the same, it's because of climate change, right? It's like everything that happens is because of climate change. And I think even just as a messaging tactic, it's, it's not, not good. good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, fair enough. Good point. Um, 
So, but let's move to this question of, of de-icing equipment, say, for Texas, which would be, you know, an insurance policy for a rare event, okay? And I would argue, and, and we'll, we'll get into this uh, as much as we want, I would argue that that is a bit of a fool's game. And I think that was part of your column to some extent. Um, your main point, I would argue, is that you said, we don't seem to have any taste for that. Why don't we start there, actually? And then I'll talk about why I think it's the wrong way to think about it. But you said, basically, you know, all the things that we learn typically about these crises after they passed using hindsight involve using a lar large amount of money that is only going to have value if this remote thing happens yeah. again. And we have zero political taste, uh, political taste. We may have some personal taste for it. We have zero political taste for these kind of expenditures, either because of the nature of the incentives facing politicians, the way we think about global societal problems. So why don't you expand on that, that issue of, well, of our unwillingness? I think it's actually worse than that, which is that we have a large political appetite for spending a lot of money on whatever just happened, on whatever yeah. really unlikely thing just happened, right? Texas may well now just install de-icing equipment on all of its power plants. And I guess there's some chance that that will end up being a good investment, right? It, sometimes these things are. Um, and similarly in the financial crisis, right? We did a ton of regulation, some of which I, I support, right? I, I think requiring banks to cover carry more reserves is basically a good idea, but we also did a lot of other random stuff that was that just sounded financial, like requiring banks to lower interchange fees, um, which had nothing to do with anything, except then I couldn't get a debit card that gave me air miles. Um, and, <laughs> you know, so, and yet, that's not necessarily, if you think about, you're going to have a certain number of rare events in any given period, 10 years, 50 years, a century, whatever, um, five years. The next thing, the next unlikely thing to happen to you is probably not going to be the unlikely thing that just happened to you. Right. And so now I don't want to get into like, you know, statistical magic where I suggest, which is not true, that... Um, this is that the bad thing that just happened is now the least likely thing to right. happen. In fact, <laughs> the bad thing that just happened is exactly as likely to happen to you as it right. was what, before. <laughs> once you get um, hit by lightning, it's okay to go out golf in a, thunder, yes. in a lightning storm with, and hold your, your golf metal golf clubs yeah. up high because it's so unlikely to get hit twice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That is, that is not a good plan. Um, but, you know, there's, with the caveat that sometimes when a really unlikely thing happens, it actually signals that something has changed and that the Correct. more un the unlikely thing has become more likely. Correct. And maybe that's true of Texas weather patterns. I am not a meteorologist. I have no idea. Um, but in general, right, the, the last unlikely thing that happened to us, and I remember when I was writing about uh, finance in the early 2000s, um, and I would ask people about the housing bubble, and I was like, "Boy, this this sure seems like bubbly." <laughs> you know, I'm watching all of these these house flipping shows on HGTV, where you just couldn't. It didn't matter what you did; you could paint the entire thing fuchsia and install like it orange fixtures, and you would double your money, right? Yeah. And um, that seemed unsustainable to me, and I, I mentioned as much to Wall Street analysts, and they all said exactly the same thing, like in the same words. The nation hasn't had a sustained nationwide decrease in home prices since the Great Depression. Yeah. And when when they said since the Great Depression, since the Great Depression was synonymous for like never, never right? Yeah. It was impossible. Um, Civil War and, time, roughly. Right, but Meaning this was long something- ago. <laughs> yes, exactly. Meaning back when people wore funny hats and, yeah. you know, it doesn't really have anything to do with us. Um, and, and you know, that is how we think. <laughs> when, when an unlikely thing hasn't happened for a while, we think it's never going to happen again. And when an unlikely thing just happened, we think we need to take a lot of preparation against it. In fact, what we should be doing is kind of looking at, you know what? Maybe financial crises are now impossible, but financial crises do seem to be a fairly regular happening in modern economies since at least the 18th century. Um, you know, maybe we are now so good at disease that we can't have a, a pandemic like the 1918 flu, um, but maybe they just only happen every, you know, every 50 to 100 years and we're due. 
right? Maybe the Yellowstone supervolcano is never going to explode again in the ways that it did that, you know, caused 10 year, you know, winters. Um, and then maybe it is. And we don't know. These are things that, you know, you, you, you should think, try to assess what the probability is based on what the probabilities are, not on recency bias about the thing that is most, you know, you know, clear to your mind and that seems like it just happened to people like you and that's just not how we think so we simultaneously under and over prepare we over prepare for one crisis because it just happens to have happened and then we under prepare for all of the other crises that could well be the next thing up right so yeah so you know different things come to mind as you talk about that one is you know we're always fighting the last war is a big you know it's a, a big theme in historical writing that People look at what happened in the last war. Yeah. The famous example is the French were worried about a, an attack from Germany, so they built the Maginot Line, which was great for stopping uh, large masses of human beings in trench warfare, really not good with tanks, and that was useless. They spent a huge amount of money, huge amount of time, and were not any safer than they had been before they did that. And that's where I want to talk about the specifics of the pandemic from that possible mistake, and while we also understand that Sometimes you do learn something from the last war that is useful for the next war. Sure. Um, as you point out, the other thing I want to, of course, allude to, or some extent, this whole conversation is about a black swan, an unlikely uh, thing. Although many people have argued the pandemic's not a black swan. We all know there's a risk of a pandemic. As you say, every few decades, and maybe more often in a more global world, this is not a black swan. This is what you exactly should be ready for. A lot of people said it was coming. Uh, and they um, had good reason. It wasn't just like uh, Cassandra kind of stuff. Um, and I, the third thing I want to mention is um, a piece I remember from Catherine Schultz, uh, the journalist and author on uh, the dangers of a massive earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and you know, the theme of that article was, this is kind of inevitable. It, it, it's not going to happen tomorrow, probably, almost certainly not going to happen tomorrow. It's almost certainly not going to happen this year. But it is a little bit scarily likely that it'll happen in the next few decades, say. And so what do you do about that? Do you not live in Seattle? Do you move? Do you make it off limits? So these are literally existential questions. I want to put those to the side. I want to focus a little more narrowly uh, on the pandemic issue. And you you mentioned this in your piece. Uh, I'm going to expand your observation that, you know, we're going to, oh, we're going to be ready for the next COVID-like thing. We're going to have a, we're going to stockpile a bunch of masks. We had stockpiled them, by the way, a bunch of things. They were neglected because by Republicans and Democrats, they were just kind of left to, they're just unpleasant to spend money on those kind of things when you're a politician or when maybe as a, as a voter, you don't like it. Uh, so presumably we're going to get better at, we're going to stockpile some masks. <clears throat> we have a lot of ventilators now, whether they're useful or not. We got a bunch of those. We solved that problem. Uh, at least at the current expected level of a really bad pandemic. Um, the more difficult questions for me are things like supply chain redundancy, uh, things that are massively, ex you know, stockpiling a, a billion masks. It, you know, it, it's money you'd rather not spend if you don't have another pandemic. But uh, it's not like a supply chain redundancy or, uh, say, stopping global travel, which would be another way to prevent uh, prevent the next pandemic, not just prevent its cost from being uh, realized. We could create a a national laboratory that would work on vaccines at a level of effort that is generally not incentivized by the current system. Current system punishes vaccine makers. Part of the challenge we've had with the vaccine and, and production is that the government took money out of the vaccine business a long time ago. Nobody generally invests in it tends to be uh, you know, a low profit experience. So pharmaceutical companies don't uh, do anything in that area much, but yeah, Operation Warp Speed, President Trump changed that from top down, which is not bad given that we'd ruined it from the bottom, you know, from before top down. And so you could argue that these are the kinds of things that we need to expand and, and, and expand greatly. Obviously we need a lot more um, you know, bird feeder production and and flower production, you know, the, all the things in toilet paper, of course. Uh, I'm going to talk about toilet paper in a minute. Uh, but anyway, so those are the kind of things that, you know, it's one thing to stockpile masks, 
to create the kind of infrastructure that we might need to reduce the challenges of the next pandemic is incredibly expensive, it seems to me. Yeah. So what, what's your reaction to that? Um, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, I would say a few things is one thing that I'm not even sure travel bans work, right? They, they slow it. But I think what you see historically is that the pandemic didn't move that much faster than say the 1918 flu, which is interesting. If you think about how much faster air travel is than boat travel. Um, and that's just because, you know, diseases are very good at spreading. If you are on an island and you can shut down real early. Australia. Um, Australia. But, you know, and I think that it is possible that travel bans can stop it long enough for the new vaccine technologies to get on the case, which is different from, say, 100 years ago. Right. I, I think our... our Biomedically, we've we've never done better, and just I mean, I'm still I wake up every morning just astonished uh, that, that we managed to produce a workable vaccine in well under a year. Not just one, five, right? Yeah. Um, so I think in that case, um, preparation is good and cheap. If there is another pandemic that looks like this, we should probably err on the side of temporary travel bans, right? Temporarily, two weeks, we're shutting down global travel. Even if this pans out to be nothing, I'm sorry that you missed your vacation, et cetera. But you know, we're we're going to be err on the side of caution if we get something that looks like it's a serious outbreak in a in a country that that could be spreading it, and then we're going to assess. and And we know how to do things like surveillance and so forth. I hope we're going to fix the CDC lab problems. <laughs> What do you, what do you mean by that? What, what do you, would you the, say the is the CDC, CDC lab problem? So this isn't the first time that the CDC screwed up the test. They contaminated the um, they contaminated the test they were making because they were process they were testing samples in the same lab that they were using to make the test. Uh, you know they were processing samples in the same lab that they were using to put the test kits together. Um, they tried to make it too complicated. The WHO had developed a simple you know easy test that a lot of countries. It, it's not true that like they offered us the test and we didn't take it. They it wasn't that they were going to send us tests. It was that we could have copied their test pretty easily and we decided to to grow our own. Um, and then the CDC lab screwed up. And this isn't the first time that the CDC lab has screwed up making a test like this. They screwed up on Zika too. They screwed up on a bunch of things. And it looks like there's just problems in the CDC that I, like most Americans, had no idea existed. Um, I, you know, I mean, this is, the CDC, just as an aside, it's an amazing story, right? Like this is what they're there for. This was the big game. This was their going to the Super Bowl. And they just, it was like they sat down on the sidelines and just decided to like not play the first quarter. Um, and, you know, so on, on that side, I think we're gonna do better next time, right? Um, at least if it happens in the next 20 years. Um, and there's this really interesting research on Wall Street, for example, that suggests that if you've had, if you've lived through a financial crisis, you don't have another one because the people who lived through it recognize the signs. And it's when the old timers start retiring that you yeah. get new bubbles. Um, but on the supply chain redundancies, I'm really, I'm experiencing some, some, um, some feelings that I as a libertarian never had before. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, part of its redundancy, and this was you like I, I'm sure, I've spent the last 40 years hearing about, well, not 40, I'm only 48. So at the age of eight, I wasn't spending a lot of time play, paying attention to supply chain management. However, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time as a, an economics student and a business journalist listening to the mantra of just in time and how just in time came and reduced is like this beautiful fairy tale. There were these huge mountains of inventory that companies were sitting on and they're just doing nothing and they were costly. And then sometimes they would get obsolete before they used all of it. And how, duh, how our ancestors were really stupid. Um, and then it turns out that in a pandemic, what you would really like is a large supply of inventory <laughs> that you can then process. Right. And right. The, the, in fact, like before, travel got so fast that was what the inventories were for was that you would have shipping interruptions if you're right. getting if you're getting ore from across the great lakes and there's a series of bad storms you don't get any ore and your coal mine shuts down you know your steel mill shuts down so instead you stockpile right um and so that i'm a little bit shifting on and i think oh, companies are shifting on too by the way they're 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 thinking about you know maybe i want a little more flex in my supply chain than i had sure. i don't want to run it as lean as possible that probably won't last that long but i think you know for the next 
three to five years, companies at least are going to be thinking that way. But the big issue for me is thinking about stockpiling goods versus kind of stockpiling capacity. And uh, Garrett Jones, the economist, for example, and I have, have had a back and forth on this privately. I don't think I'm outing him as, uh, but you know, he says, look, we can stockpile mass. We can stockpile all of this stuff. And my thought is like, yeah, we could have maybe for this pandemic, although the, the number of masks we went through, I think it's implausible that we would have stockpiled that many. Um, but I think about what if this had gone on for three years, right? Um, and what if it's all in China, which is a strategic rival to the US, right? And which not like bought up our masks and then wouldn't export any to us, right? And really, uh, I don't blame them. That's probably what we would have done too. Um, but I think about if, you know, if go back to World War II, think about World War II and think about how fast America ramps up as the arsenal of democracy, right? We're doing it even before we get into World War II. We're lend lease yeah. and so forth, right? But we had all of these people who knew how to do that, right? We had not just forget the physical plant. You can build physical plant. Um, what we had was we had a lot of machinists. We had clusters of manufacturing. We had people who knew what they were doing. And then when we mobilized for war, we could bring in a ton of new people and the old people who knew what they were doing could train them. If you don't have the people who know what they're doing, if you just don't have that capacity at all, you can't, it's, it's really hard to build, right? How do you build a, an entire manufacturing industry from scratch in, in two years? And you can think of that as a kind of stockpiling. And you can, you can think of it as a kind of, of making yourself capable of meeting various crises. Now, there are downsides to what we would have to do to maintain those capacities is the problem, right? We, would, we, would, we might end up with kind of protected industries, which often are very inefficient. They aren't actually good at what they do and so forth. So I, I don't know necessarily how we should meet this challenge, but I think it is a real challenge that I would, I would definitely not have. I mean, I don't know, like 10 years ago, maybe, maybe longer, maybe 15 years ago, I wrote a really mean review in the New York Sun of Barry Lynn, who actually remembered the review and I felt so bad. I ended up at a think tank with him where we were both fellows for a little while. Awkward. And he remembered my terrible review and I Shocking. felt so awful. I was, <laughs> I was an obnoxious kid. I thought of him as a big famous person who'd written a book and I was just some dumb jerk who got to write, paid 150 bucks to write book reviews for the New York Sun. Um, and I was a little jealous and far meaner than I should have been. And I don't write reviews like that anymore. Um, but, you know, I would just like to take this opportunity to say, Mr. Lin, but, you know, when we, when I apologized, I said, I wouldn't have written it that way, but I still don't think that your argument about supply chains being vulnerable and, and I, I'm still pretty skeptical. I would just like to take this opportunity to say, like, Mr. Lin, I think you had some, you were onto something and I was not just inappropriate in tone, but I should have taken you more seriously. So, um, you know, that I'm, I'm really revisiting and that's really hard for me because I, this, what I'm urging goes against everything that I believe as, a, you know, is economically efficient as a matter of political economy. But I think, especially given that the, the current arsenal of the, the, the current manufacturing capital of the world is a strategic rival to the United States, I'm really rethinking, you know, how we might think about bringing some of those um, those capacities back back here because I am worried not so much about. I don't think we need as much capacity as we would have to have to meet a pandemic in the case of PPE or so forth, or as much mil defense manufacturing capabilities we would need to meet a war. What I think is that we need a strategic reserve of people who know how to do these things. And so one idea, for example, that I think is interesting is that we should just, um, you know, there's arguments for doing this in a like a stick sort of way is like arguing that we should try to get semiconductor manufacturing back here by saying to the Taiwanese firms that do most of the fabs, um, if you want to uh, sell us chips, you have to transfer technology. This is what China does, by the way, to, to American firms that go there. But I prefer to say like, look, Taiwan, you're in a pretty dangerous area. And it looks to me like China is really, really thinking about invading and taking your islands over. So you know what? Like 
visas for everyone. Bring your chip fabs here. Bring all of your skilled workers. We we want you. We will subsidize the transfer of those of those company manufacturing. We will give visas to everyone. Pathway to citizenship. It's good for us. It's good for you. Do what Britain did for Hong Kong. I think that would be like a a wonderful way to kind of promote some of this coming back is instead of, of doing it on the stick side, say, look, there are strategic things where we are willing to give people tax breaks and, um, and visas in order to come here, show us and build an industry here so that we will have it, we will have the knowledge and, and the personal capacity um, when we need it. Well, that was a lot there. Was, um, I think I need to bring you back into the free market fold a little bit if I, I'm going to try. Um, okay. And like you, like you, I've had, you know, and I've talked about this on the program. There are things that happened here in the last year I didn't expect. As a market-oriented economist, I thought things would go more swimmingly. Uh, the question is, well, I'm going to start, I'm going to make a couple of observations. I don't know if I can directly re respond to what you said, but the first thing I want to say, I want to talk about toilet paper. We talked about toilet paper with John Cochran recently, and a listener uh, with some industry expertise, wrote me and made the following observation, which which I'd heard before, but he, he brought it to me in a different way, which is, you know, the toilet paper world has two markets, home and away, home and work. Uh, the home market has a different quality uh, to it, a different demand for quality. And what happened with the pandemic is there's a massive increase in the demand for home quality toilet paper because people are going to work. So they're using more toilet paper at home because during the times when they would normally be using it at work, they're using it at home. The claim is, and I think this is correct, is there were two, he made two claims. One, to increase the, the home supply, you can't just transfer the, the roles from work to home because the quality is different and the distribution is different, right? It's not just, it's not easy for the people who sell toilet paper to fat, to offices to, to sell it to grocery stores. Now, I'm not, I'm a little bit surprised about that. I wouldn't think that'd be so hard to fix, but let's take that as possibly true. The second problem, of course, is that, well, you want to make more home quality toilet paper, but it, it's a big investment. And if the pandemic problems last for three months or even a year, just not worth it. So, you know, what, what is the, you know, I think we've kind of weathered that storm though. You know, I think we don't need a national toilet paper production process. We don't need to nationalize the toilet paper industry. And I, I'd like prices to be more flexible. Uh, and it could be that there's both legal reasons and maybe cultural and social reasons for why prices didn't respond the way I would have hoped they did during the early days, especially the pandemic. But we kind of did okay, actually. There was not really, it was unpleasant. There was some anxiety there, but not a big deal. Second thing I want to say is that we did build a massive amount of overcapacity unintentionally through government policy. I've alluded to this. I want to make it clearer and get your reaction to it, which is that because we've subsidized the pharmaceutical industry for the last 25 years, we've created a massive army of chemists, biochemists, and thoughtful and skilled people working in private labs who I thought, you know, we have too many of them. And my apologies to, to friends and family in that industry. I think we have too many. I think we've over we've made it too profitable. So there's too much innovation of the kind that isn't worth the money that it, we're spending on it. Many, you know, we have a lot of episodes discussing this for listeners who want to dig deeper. But there was a huge upside to that over expenditure and that waste, what I think is wasted money. There was an enormous army of people, really smart, talented people to work on a vaccine in two days. And you could say, well, you know, they weren't all in the United States. They weren't. But you know what? The reason those pharmaceutical companies overseas have so many employees is because about half of the pharmaceutical market is here in the United States because of the way we've oversubsidized it. Yeah. And as a result, there were people all over the world ready to create a vaccine to sell to the United States. And, and they did. And it's been, you know, it's, you can argue whether it's fair or who should get it first and, and whether the United States should have a big supply to start with. But that phenomenon, the fact that we got a vaccine produced, intellectually produced in two days, and then produced eventually, literally produced in, in under a year, which everyone said was impossible. It's going to take at least 18 months. That was yeah. due to a that enormous excess capacity in that industry that was sitting there yeah. and, and the willingness of, of 
the Trump administration to, to subsidize it out of pocket. And I would argue, and I'd like to get your reactions, I think that is the, you can argue, we can argue for a while, and maybe we will, if maybe not in this, all in this episode, about the missteps and, and lost opportunities that the Trump administration uh, had in, in the pandemic. But this was a good one. This was a really good thing that that there was a, and and by the way, <laughs> uh, it's not just uh, the so-called Operation Warp Speed. There was also you know because Pfizer didn't participate. No, they just got a guaranteed X billion dollar contract of purchases in advance to to help sure. them to incentivize them. So that was a really good idea, and I would argue that that is the single biggest lesson of the pandemic. That it's not what do we do to prevent the next one, and I think this is true for all of the examples that yeah. you give: the the power grid, the uh, the uh, Yellowstone volcano. It, it's not what do we do to prevent the next one. It's what do we do to adapt to the next one, and the insurance for adaptability, I would argue, is cheaper than the insurance for prevention, and one of the reasons is that the insurance for prevention is a really bad idea if that thing never comes back again. But the insurance right. for adaptability has lots of applications. And the vaccine's a perfect example. We're going to get all kinds of pleasant things, I think, out of the science that went into that. Uh, there are all kinds of ways of when adapt adaptation is possible for dealing with more than just this crisis. And so what I would argue is the single thing, I, if I were in charge... <laughs> Unlikely, don't you think? If I, I were in I don't charge, know. I would vote for you for yeah, for you. World Czar. Ditto, and but and vice and back to you. But but the problem, of course, is that once we were in office, we would act a lot like the other people. But mm -hmm. my point is, is that I think the single most important lesson from this crisis is that in two days in January of 2020, more than one, I think, pharmaceutical company figured out how to fix this problem. We should have spent every effort we had to speed that up, <laughs> and we didn't. You know, yeah. the states didn't do a good job, reasonably so. You know, hard to do, first time. Haven't done a lot of this. That's one of the reasons Israel, I think, did so well. A different kind of health system. Not totally centralized, but not totally decentralized. Not state government driven in many ways, even though it's, it's highly subsidized. Also, states, Israel is just incredibly good at high-speed lifeboat ethics, right? That is their specialty. Yeah. So. And it's a small place. There's a lot of reasons, yeah. but more a lot of things going on there. But <laughs> my point is, is that I think uh, the only thing that that I the single most important thing we do the next time is speed up the two one two things: testing, which you mentioned, and and getting that virus the vaccine out quicker, getting it produced quicker, getting it tested quicker taking some chances, as, as John Cochran and others have suggested, uh, keeping the incentives there for them to produce it and make a lot of money, I hope, in doing it. And um, everything else, I think, is, is for me, is really uncertain how important it is. I, I don't know. I don't. I think stockpiling masks is a horrible idea. You can make a mask out of a pair of socks. Yes, it's not as good as an N95. Yes, it's good to have N95 capacity in the United States. Yes, it's good to have smart people who are capable of building a factory in case all the N95s are produced by someone you have global conflict with. That's all true. But I think we could do all those things. I think we can I think we can figure out how to produce N95 masks here in the United States. I don't I really think that's I don't think we need to stockpile that capacity in our people. I think that's my thought. Well, anyway, I've said too much. Your no. turn. In the case of masks, we have a U.S. manufacturer, and here is yes. actually one of the places where the Trump administration fell down. And the reason they fell down was that Donald Trump didn't like masks. He thought they looked unmanly. He wanted everyone to just pretend the pandemic wasn't happening and then it wouldn't be happening and the economy would go back up and he would get reelected. Right. Yep. So um, it didn't work out. Right. There's so he liked, vac <laughs> he liked vaccines. He didn't like masks. And so they subsidized vaccines. I think we could have done more, honestly. I think we should have built, so uh, for example, <laughs> Yeah, it's so cheap. We should have we should have paid all like taken the top five candidates and said we will buy enough vaccine to vaccinate every single person in the United States and we're gonna give away whatever we don't use. Right? First one we will use the first good one that we get and then the rest of it we just give away. It would have been a huge benefit of soft power. It would have been cheap at eight times the price that we're paying for these yeah. things. It when would we have say been, cheap. It's billions of dollars, but yeah. it's it's dwarfed 
by the, the, the social by the economic and social damage, costs. Damage yeah. to children not going to school. I mean, it's it, it right. It's such. Uh, we should have paid well them to build more factories. We should have just spent money like it was going out of style. Yeah. Um, but we should have done the same thing with N95 masks because N95 masks are extremely effective at preventing you from getting it as well as preventing um, as well as preventing you from transmitting it. Um, they're just a much more effective technology. We had a domestic manufacturer here, Prestige America Tech, who in could Texas. have ramped. Yep, in Texas. That company could have ramped up their production more, according to early reports, um, and they didn't. And the reason they didn't was that you had to buy these very expensive machines, and they didn't want to invest in all that capacity and then uh, get stuck with it and Reasonable. get stuck with the cost of it after the pandemic. And so they produced what they had the machines to make now. Well, we should have just gone in there and said, you know what? We'll, we'll buy you the machines. <laughs> How many can you get? put them all in, just roll out these masks. We should have been sending, we should be getting them free with a box of cornflakes. Yeah. Uh, we did not do that. And that was a big loss because it could have gotten us back sooner. We could have had people going into movie theaters and doing all of these things. Had we actually done the stuff that kept people, you could have gone in with it. I, I have, I have been, I have uh, now, it is now okay to buy uh, N95 masks and I have a couple of them. And it makes a big difference in terms of like, I can go into a store and feel safe. And I wouldn't go into those stores if I didn't have those masks, right? And so that is the stuff where I think, um, you know, we could have done so much more than we did on that front. But I agree with you that we like, first of all, it's we should stockpile some masks just because we, you know, in the first flush of the few days, you want supplies that you can send quickly to the places that are having hotspots, right? You want to be able to just dump as many masks as New York needs on, on New York, rather than having them wear garbage bags and reuse their respirators. However, I, I completely agree with you that we don't want all of the masks we, can, we could conceivably use during a pandemic. I think what we want is the capacity to adapt. But I think we have to think about what is that with pharmaceuticals, with masks. I agree with you. We have that capacity. But with something like semiconductors, we don't make them here, right? It, 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 the, this that is just not capacity that we have right now. And if we had a different crisis, that might be an issue. And I think we should think about first of all. I am. Uh, I d think I disagree with you. I actually like the hog wild pharmaceutical spending in the United States. I just think you know, look, we're we're such a rich country. You go into the supermarket. There's like a whole wall of stuff that just makes your laundry softer, right? What else are we going to spend our money on other than getting healthier, right? This is great. My mother's vaccinated now. My father's vaccinated. I feel wonderful. It's just like it's such. It, I am so happy we spent every penny of that money. And I think most Americans actually feel the same way, is that they are happy that we have that capacity, we have all of those people. Um, I think we have to, you know, we have to think about what it means to have the capacity to adapt. And I don't think we're good at that. No, I agree. Right? Like yeah. we're, we're, we, because we didn't do that deliberately. No, right? that was just and a bonus. Maybe we can't. That was gravy. Yeah, it was, was a long yap. And uh, and I love luck. I'm happy we had it. And I think <laughs> the United States has more luck than most because we're bigger and richer and you get a lot of luck when you're big and rich. Um, but we could have more if we were a little more thoughtful about policy in, on a, in a bunch of directions, right? And, and to go back to the, the masks um, and to go back to what we didn't do in the pandemic, we just didn't think big enough, right? We should have, why were we so stingy about it? It's just, you look at how much money we were losing and it's just incredible to me that we didn't pour even more money into the, into the adaptation because the adaptations were the fastest, easiest way to actually get this back to normal. We can't prevent a pandemic from emerging. We can't, you know, go into the place in part because people are, humans are pushing into more and more kind of marginal areas and farming and so forth, and they encounter wild animals. And those wild animals have new diseases that can pass to humans. Um, you know, there's intensive agriculture. The more people that, that we have on the planet, the more intensively we're gonna be farming and the richer people get, the more there's gonna be uh, animal agriculture, right? There's gonna be farming, livestock, and, and diseases passing back and forth. So I think we're probably more likely to have a pandemic now yeah, than I don't we think were. So. I don't um, think so. Than, <laughs> well, <laughs> I think we're moving. I think we're moving to a lot more lab-based meat 
and and lab based agriculture that, that I think will maybe, reduce maybe. that risk. You know risk. what? If in in that case, yes, the the risk goes down. But the the point is, okay, let's 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 if we want to do prevention, let's invest in in really good lab based steak, right? Well, that's the. Um, but think around corners like that, right? Don't think about like, well, I want to make the the United States the leading manufacturer of surgical gowns. I agree that is not that is not yeah. something that we we desperately need to have. But we do need to think about what capacities do we need to have in order to be able to adapt. But I think you know what I learned from your piece that I'm not sure is is the main theme, and maybe you didn't intend it. Is there's too many things to worry about. You can't. It's and, and it's not. It's not. A, it's not a cognitive problem. It's that. Preparing for the array of uh, existential risks is um, would require a fundamental readjustment of of life that most people literally don't want, and they're much happier adapting, doing the best they can. Um, I think. I think the real question, and I'm going to try to bring you back into again into the market oriented fold is. Is who plans, who takes the risk, who who builds the insurance, the capacity for adaptation, and I think government is particularly bad at it. There's an argument that you know government has to do it because there's no incentive for the private sector to do it because they, they why would they build for the future? Problem is politicians have the same problem. It's not solved by turning it over to the public sector, and in fact, you're more likely to get cronyism. I worry that that would not spend that money of precaution and prevention wisely. And I think that, I think we ought to be looking for ways to give private actors the chance to bear the cost of insurance, which means, just take a trivial example. I bet a lot of people in Texas are, have changed what they keep in their basements. <laughs> I don't know if they have many basements in Texas, but, and I'm yeah, sure- I don't but, either. <laughs> I don't know if they do, but uh, you know, I, it, I'm, I'm not sure I'm pro or anti-basement. I have a lot of issues with basements, water, storage on the plus side, water on the negative side. Anyway, but I'm sure they've changed their stockpiling habits. As you say, that'll probably die out once the people who've lived through this die out and, and they'll be vulnerable again. But that's just a trivial way that people worry about an anticipated possible low probability event. They take private action. They don't say, oh, the government has to stockpile water in case there's a uh, a four degree day and, and we don't have de-icing equipment. Let individuals can, some can stockpile, some can choose not to, some can take risks, some cannot. What, what we want the government to do is to do the things that it does particularly well. Now, you and I might disagree about what those are, and certainly you and I together would disagree with a bunch of other people. But one of the things it doesn't do well, and no one does well, is to try to figure out where the next thing is coming from. And so what what I think we ought to do is to, again, keep the profit, keep the incentives, the carrot, not the stick that you mentioned earlier, keep the carrot available for people who are foresighted and farsighted and take and absorb risk so that when that thing comes along, let it make a lot of money. So if somebody wants to stockpile N95s and sell them at a big profit, people can do that, should be able to do that now, but now they won't because they know and they've, been, they've learned. That if you stockpile N95s to prepare for a, a pandemic, the government's not going to let you profit from that. They're not going to let you recoup your costs of storage. They're going to call you a price gouge or put you in jail. That's a mistake. Yeah, I understand the political incentives. It's a mistake. Telling people they can't make money from vaccines is a mistake. We can get around it. We can reestablish those incentives, right. you know, as we've done. But I think it's the wrong way to organize the process of how do we prepare. For an uncertain future, and I think, I think it's tempting to to look at the current mess and say, "Well, look how badly the, you know, the say the private sector did with say toilet paper or with whatever it is." Uh, I don't think the government generally does better. Uh, and and I'm going to go off topic. I'm going to totally because I, I have to say this because it's important. Um, I know there are listeners out there who think masks are stupid. They you write me on Twitter and say. Oh, people in Florida did fine and they ignored masks. And, you know, that's the same thing folks are saying that people in Japan did great and they're obsessed with masks. You don't know. There's too much else going on. It's it's really not smart to argue that, well, Florida doesn't wear masks. Florida is not a person. Florida doesn't have a face. There were some people in Florida who wore masks, some people who didn't. 
some of them were more vulnerable. You know, it's really complicated. So I am not, uh, I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot of evidence. Not, I don't. There's not a lot of evidence about whether masks work or don't work. It just seems kind of smart to me than an airborne thing. You want to keep your respiratory system away from other people's as much as you can. And it's cheap. So for me, it's kind of like a no-brainer that wearing a mask is a, is a good decision for yourself and for others. You could argue, well, we may find out it actually doesn't work as well as we thought. I got a headline today. A supercomputer has proved that two masks don't help. I was like, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> That's really yeah, a bad I, th- I think there's, I often have these, I have these conversations with people about the minimum wage, right? Where they, you know, the minimum wage doesn't do anything. You can raise it to $15 an hour. The disemployment, is, you know, like there's, yeah. there's. We know. We and know. we know. We, right. Science has proven, yeah. right? And. You know, I, look, I think that the magnitude of these changes is lower, is probably lower, certainly in the cities where it's been tested, in the booming economies where it's been tested, than I would have thought it was 15 years ago. But that said, like at the end of the day, what's the mechanism by which you raise the price of something and nothing happens like over and over and over again, right? And I, similarly about the mask, if you think this, if you think this doesn't work, right, like put on a mask and try spitting. Yeah, there you um, go. Right, like it's it, it, it's it's actually like no, actually the laws of physics. You're at some level end up arguing with the laws of physics. Yeah, and 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 similarly, when people say like lockdowns don't work, you end up arguing against the germ theory of disease. And unless you have a really good refutation of the germ theory of disease, you know, if people stay at home, it is just it has to be at some point mathematically true that they cannot pass a contagious disease onto other people. I think where there is a real argument is that there's a concept in in medical research called intention to treat, um, where you you study the effects not of um, actually treating people, but of offering them the treatment, because that's what real world policies look like, yeah. right? Is that you, you give someone, um, you give someone a d- hypertension diagnosis and you give them blood pressure medication, right? But most people, literally, by by nine months, most people are not taking their their uh, hypertension meds as directed. Um, so you have to study what does it look like in the real world, Correct. not what would it look like if I could stick this person in a lab and make Correct. them do exactly what the design is. And similarly with mass mandates, with lockdowns, you know, they would be really, really extremely effective if everyone used them as directed if they didn't then say yes but of course you know when it was my best friend's birthday i had the girls over and we didn't wear our masks while we were sitting around in the living room gabbing for 10 hours right that's um you you have to don't argue that that doesn't work argue that you know the actual legal policies don't do as much as you would expect and i think that's right i think these are these are marginal interventions but they're but in the case of mass it's such a cheap intervention so i'm gonna i'm gonna push back on the lockdown because i you know I, i think it's way too early to, first of all, I have no idea if they worked. I, I think, as you say, laws of physics, staying at home more often than not staying at home probably helps. I'm okay with that. But you can't really lock down is the problem. There are always going to be people who are working together. If we're going to feed ourselves, unless we're going to stockpile you know, a year's worth of food in our house and, and toilet paper and jigsaw puzzles and flour, um, all the things that uh, bird feeders. Bird feeders are very in short supply, I hear. Um, people are staying home want to look at the birds i did not know that yeah. i knew about the flower i actually talked of to King Arthur did. flower it was it's fascinating what they oh, you incredible. know they saw a fourfold increase in demand for flour just just like bread flour there yeah. there, it, there was their bread flour everyone's making bread and then what and at the same time of course they have their assembly lines are working at low pro are very low productivity because they have to distance people and so oh, right. trying to to deal with those two things at once fascinating really and they, fascinating they Responded very aggressively, yeah. as be, not not as aggressively as if there'd been a national flower commission or czar. But anyway, um, the lockdown problem. The thing I have a problem with, with lockdown is that I I worry it was relatively ineffective and incredibly expensive. And I think we haven't we we still have to see what the costs are. Um, and I, I think the. Um, Right. I'm not necessarily saying it's we can argue about whether it was worth the cost and we can argue about whether it has a big effect compared to what people are doing individually, because there's some evidence that people just kind of 
you know, like hold their activity at roughly a level that produces a, a transmission rate of one, which is one, one sick person gets one other person uh, sick, and that the government intervention might not have had that much impact in addition to that. Although I think the experience of, say, the UK uh, indicates that if you really actually get very serious about it and use enforcement, um, you know, they really just, their numbers plummeted in a way that other countries that are vaccinated have not seen happening, which tends to make me think that at least if you are really hardcore about it, it, it does have an effect. I'm going to push back on that because my friends in the UK say nobody paid any attention to any of those things. They, they don't wear masks there. They wander around freely. They have parties. They go to the pubs. They didn't do anything. Is that? Uh, but is that in the? Is that since the var new variant showed up? Because my sense. No, this is, is all the way are... through. This is oh, all fair. the way through. I, I mean, that that's my impression. Yeah. It's very very anecdotal. Uh, but I, I would just I would go back to uh, Israel for a minute. A lot of people applauded Israel for its Israel had very aggressive lockdown. They they yeah. they follow you on your phone. If you leave your apartment, uh, I think in in Australia, which is an island in Australia, if you. I think if you if you left your hotel during quarantine when you arrived, I think it's a twenty thousand dollar fine, and uh, that that deters a lot of people uh, from yeah. going out. Uh, but you know, Israel had very serious lockdowns, and then they lifted them, and then of course it came back. You know, I, you know, I, I had people on Twitter applauding Israel. Go, oh, good job. They know how to respond. Well, but if it comes back, all you did is bear a lot of costs for you know, to delay it. Well, I, I think, look, if you if you think that vaccination is going to, if you've got a, the last lockdown they did, they were doing knowing that they had enough vaccine True. to vaccinate the entire population, yep. right? And if all you're doing is delaying it in the context of a vaccine that's going to radically shift your death load, that's, and, and again, I think there's more argument for short-term lockdowns the way Australia does them, where most of the time everything's open. And then if they get cases in a city, it's just, everything gets shut down for a couple of, you know, for four five weeks days. or so. No, they do five, um, five days. Five days, whatever it is. I like, I haven't been following it that closely, but, um, you know, they shut everything down so that transmission stops and then they reopen everything as soon as they're, they're clear that the chain is broken. And that's, I think I would have certainly taken that over the year I spent going very few places just personally, even if it was allowed. But I think, I think that's partly because they're an island. Uh, yeah. and and could control the, the flow of people in and out in a way Absolutely. that a large country can't. Um, so I don't know. I'm so I'm agnostic on on quote lockdown. I don't think, um, and I think lockdowns, as I've suggested before, is sort of a, a misleading word in the United States because we did not lock down in any yeah. way. We, we forced some things to close. Some of those might have closed anyway because people didn't want to go out. Yeah. Uh, they self, I would call it, you know, it's self quarantining is it can mimic the effect of a lockdown. Uh, but as you point out, many people fail. They claim they're self quarantining and then they hang, they hang out with their family or friends in ways that were probably uh, not always so good. But you know, I think some of the more common sense, obvious things we've learned about staying a little further apart from people, farther apart from people when, when a pandemic's raging, wearing a mask, these are cheap. These are really inexpensive. Don't it's shake different hands. Things. Don't shake hands. Yeah. Don't hug your friends. It's hard. I don't like it. I really hate it. But not sending your kids to school, I think we will find, was a horrific error, I hope, that turns out uh, to be learned. If, in fact, it is a horrific error, we'll see. Uh, and and very uh, bad socially, I think, for for the fabric of, of democracy. I think you know a lot of wealthy people were able to bear virtually no cost of that. And I think poor people are going to have a larger cost going forward for a long time. I'm worried. We'll see. But let's close with, um, you know, with other. It's very hard to calibrate one, say, free market flavor. You know, if I'm a eight point seven on a scale of one to ten, and you're an eight point, let's say you were an eight point four before, but now you're at seven point. I mean, I, so that's kind of that's silly. Uh, yeah, it's also this is really limited. I want to make make it clear. I'm not suggesting that we need like strategic toilet paper reserves. Yeah. <laughs> nor am I suggesting that we need to massively. I'm, I'm just thinking more broadly about how are we maintaining our capacities to adapt more broadly. I think that also has to do with investing in scientific research. And I think it has to do with not, I mean, you know, really in the pharmaceutical industry, in a lot of ways, what we're talking about is not intervening to force prices down. Yeah. Right. And, and it turned out it was a good idea to not intervene to force prices down because then we had all of these biochemists who were who were able to leap into action that we wouldn't have had if we'd had half as much pharmaceutical research going on, right? 
So I think, and it, it's very possible that if, you know, here's the interesting thing is that the mRNA vaccines were um, not developed for vaccines my understanding is the technology was actually developed for other things and it doesn't work for long-term treatments because your body, the mRNA is safe, take your vaccines, it's fine. Um, but uh, your body sees it as kind of funky and it doesn't, and so it it re gives its kind of immune response to it. And that meant that as a treatment, it didn't work um, because your body would start noticing it. And that's why, for example, these vaccines are, are notorious for creating a very sore arm, mm -hmm. um, because your, your immune system is like, whoa, what th that MRNA does not look quite right to me. Um, but that said, um, you know, would this, if we had had a European style drug pricing, right, where we had, cut a lot of the fat, the speculative stuff, we had reduced the payoff to doing highly speculative pharmaceutical research, would that technology have been around? Or would that have been one of the things that people looked at that and said, yeah, you know, that's pretty speculative. And I'm just not seeing how that there's any chance we're gonna get our money back given what a government's likely to pay for it. Let's focus on, you know, whatever I can get government grants to do research for, whatever is taxpayer favored. And so, um, you know, we might have more, we might have almost as many cancer treatments because governments like paying for those. And we might have a lot fewer things like the mRNA vaccine. So I'm glad that our government didn't intervene in the way that European governments do. Um, and I'm glad that we maintain that capacity. And I think it's worth asking, you know, I've pitched this as like, why don't we give the, the Taiwanese semiconductor fabs tax breaks and visas to come here. Fabs um, being of, fabricators. Just yeah, case, fabricators. You know, yeah. And of course, I also just, I like high skilled visa immigration anyway. So yes, just give people <laughs> visas to come here anyway. I don't like China and I feel bad for Taiwan. So uh, take that, you know, take that caveat. Um, but also look for where are the ways that our government is suppressing our adaptive capacity? Yeah. by going into markets and intervening to get an outcome that is politically convenient, um, but is not actually giving us. And, you know, I, I don't know what those places are, and I don't know uh, if there are any, but I think that is probably the for the low-hanging fruit that all libertarians can agree on, which is in the places where the government is going in and kind of artificially making sure that supply is low and price is low, um, let's let's pull back from those. When as, let, this should add an argument to our arsenal, where those industries are likely to be uh, strategically important in the case of asteroid defense, or um, you know, a, a war with China, or with a pan another pandemic, or with all of these you know these these high low probability but high badness uh, potential disasters. Asteroid defense, I do think, I, I will say, I think that the government should be investing more in this. And also I think that's actually something the government's probably gonna have to do. But I will say that you know private companies like SpaceX are also uh, showing us that there is a big role for private initiative here. And the number of tech billionaires uh, who just apparently want to use their money to like get us humanity into space. It just makes me love big tech more. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a lot about Megan's biases. And, and, uh, yes, I mean, like, it is true. I, I, I am I'm trying not to make this about like my personal preferences. I would like to go to space very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if anyone has a spare spot on their rocket, I will go. Um, but, you know, that said, uh, you know, I think that there, there really are ways in which we're suppressing our own adaptive capacity right now. So let's close with... Um a little bit more about lessons learned. I want to clarify what I said. You know, I said one of the lessons learned is that, you know, vaccines make a big difference. Let's get them out quicker. I, I think if we had not suppressed the profit of those, we wouldn't have had to worry about it as much. But given that we have suppressed the profit, I'm I'm okay with, with subsidizing them uh, up front like that. I think that was a good move. I would have preferred a different move, but under the circumstances, it was okay. I would like to see the government spend less uh, time restricting the availability of private tests. Uh, the role of the FDA, I think, has not been so good. The CDC, um, I think, destroyed a lot of its credibility going forward. And I think human beings in the modern age are going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out for themselves what's risky and what isn't. Um, 
they basically, um, although people still tell me, oh, this is okay because so-and-so, I won't quote who it is, says, says it's okay. I'm thinking, but so-and-so said other things are okay that weren't okay. Why, why are you trusting them now? Uh, because it's a political place, CDC. So is the World Health Organization, tragically. They just ended their, I think, prematurely ended their mission in China to figure out where this thing started. Ah, it'll take some time. We're going to think about some more. It's like, oh, nice. Uh, I think that was probably not a science-driven decision. Um, you don't say, Russ. Yeah, I know. So so I want to hear – I'm going to let you close with – is there anything else you want to add to what you, you've learned that surprised you or mistakes – You've confessed to what? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've re re retracted your bitter review of Barry Lynn's book. Is there yes. anything else you want to you want to? Um, and by the way, I think we should just have an econ talk where we invite reviewers to come onto the program and apologize for a, a snarky review that not only was too snarky but actually was wrong. So I think it's a fantastic potential. <laughs> uh, could just be a website. It started. It's been anyway, gnawing at me, so I'm tell. glad I got that off my chest. Good. But is there anything else you want to say in closing about things that surprised you, that things you wrote early on in this and you realized, oh, you look back on them and say, well, I, I, I think I jumped the gun there or I really missed an opportunity. And I think now what we need to do is X. Anything else? Um, yeah. I mean, the things that surprised me are institutional, our institutions failed at levels I did not anticipate at every level. You know, it's easy to blame Donald Trump and oh boy, I do. However, um, you know, Donald Trump didn't sneak into the CDC offices at night and, uh, and mess yeah. with the reagents in the lab test. That was on the <laughs> CDC. Now, maybe a better president would have intervened. <laughs> and he didn't lie and say, don't buy masks. They don't work today. Yeah. And then I later, mean, that, oh, they're really good. <laughs> the, the level, look, I knew that public health had been highly politicized. Public health has this problem, which is that we don't have as much infectious disease as we did. You know, in, in many ways, not technologically, but institutionally, we would have been way better prepared to deal with this in 1930. Hmm. Because, you know, if you if you ever look at movies about hospitals in 1930, they're fascinating, right? Everyone's in white, including the doctors, they, you know, no scrubs. This is, and they're all in these really kind of arcane, their outfits buttoned from the back and so yeah. forth. Um, and that's because they really cared about about protecting like infection control. Now we care too, but we don't care as much because we have antibiotics, right? If and if a patient who went in for surgery got infections, which was a huge risk, that patient was going to die, and there wasn't you couldn't give them yeah. a shot, right? So they they spent more time worrying about infection control, yeah. and they were better at it. They were they were more serious about quarantine. I mean, you know, when people say I I, I have this conversation with a lot of people on the right who say, this is un-American, America would never do any, you know, this is the, the unprecedented. And I say, you know what? In, in, in the 1900s, the city of New York locked Mary Mellon, told a woman named Mary Mellon that she had an option. She could uh, have her gallbladder removed or she could go to jail for the rest of her life. And those were her two options. And the reason they told her this was that she was a typhoid carrier and they had told her she was a typhoid carrier and she was also a cook. Um, and they told her, but she didn't believe in the germ theory of disease. And she was a, I don't know, budding, <laughs> budding anarchist. And she would say, okay. And then she would go off and get a job as a cook and a bunch of people would die. Now it wasn't that our, our 19th century ancestors loved liberty less than we did. They were much, they read the Declaration of Independence at the 4th of July every year. <laughs> they right? knew they what had, was in it. <laughs> they knew what was in it, but also, you know, they had this, they were much more in many ways, right? The many fewer restrictions on daily life in 1900 than there are now, um, even in even in red states. And yet the people of the time ultimately thought, well, of course I don't like randomly jailing people who haven't actually, you know, she hadn't killed anyone. She hadn't done anything that she knew was wrong. She just thought the experts were wrong and stupid, um, which sounds familiar. Um, and, but the people of the time were like, well, yeah, but I just don't want to get typhoid. And it turns out that Americans don't love liberty more than they love not getting typhoid. And we yeah. were much more serious about quarantine 100 years ago than we are now. And so the idea that this is some novel infringement by, by overweening blue state Americans is just 
not true. Um, but we had institutional failures up and down the chain at the state level, at the local level, you know, Andrew Cuomo forcing nursing homes to take COVID positive patients back, all of, you know, to state governors who, um, you know, flagrantly refused to do even really basic things like masks. Um, you have this now. I don't understand why red states, why Mississippi and Texas, look, I think there's a real argument on reopening. Um, I don't I, I don't agree with I would be more conservative on this than they are, but I think there's a legitimate argument to be had about how much price we should be willing to pay, especially now that we can vaccinate vulner, vulnerable people. Um, but why the masks? It's just this like symbolic politics. Obviously, Donald Trump made all of these. It was fascinating because I watched it. Early on, conservatives loved masks. They were really mad at the CDC for saying masks don't work. They were making fun of it. Um, they were making the same, basically the same arguments I am about the laws of physics, and then Donald Trump wouldn't wear one. And then they felt compelled to defend Donald Trump. And there wasn't really a defense of Donald Trump won't wear one, except masks don't work. So they started arguing that masks don't work, and then they got really invested in it. It became symbolic politics. Um, and I think that- Tribalism. That, yeah, and it's on the of, other side too. Yeah. Right. I, I live. So I live in Washington, D.C. I don't think I need to wear a mask outside. I am perfectly happy to walk around not wearing a mask because I think the odds that I am going to get masks, I'm going to get COVID from a passerby in my in not very dense neighborhood. Right. Yeah. It's just extremely low yeah. um, and not worth the fact that it's actually very hard to exercise in these things. Right. It doesn't matter. I wear a mask because in my neighborhood, you are like a sociopath if you right. don't wear at least one and preferably two masks when you're out walking around on the street. Yeah. And so, and that is also political. And, you know, and it was really telling because Texas and Mississippi lifted all their restrictions and there was all this news coverage and all this Twitter fulmination about um, how, uh, people, uh, you know, about how they were, they were killing people and so forth. And then connect, Connecticut announced that they were also lifting most of their restrictions. They are leaving the mask mandate. And this goes back to what I said about symbolic politics. Um, and no one was like, why is the governor of, of Connecticut just determined to kill his citizens, right? This it's, is very political. And I didn't predict that. I would have predicted that we would pull together more like World War II. Yeah. And, I, the, and less that we would have, it would have driven us even farther apart. And I also think that in the early days, the, the biggest mistake I made was in the early days, I envisioned a kind of Australia style lockdown, right? Where like, we all really do this, but we do it for a short period of time and we crack it. We get this thing totally suppressed to the point where we stand up massive contact tracing um, and testing capability. And then we just go about our lives, right? So I was predicting a much more severe lockdown, but I was, I, I was pitching it for, you know, like maybe three months, right? It's like everyone really get into their house, everyone really pull together and act like this matters. And for three months, we're going to just knock this thing in the head. And then we're going to stand up contact tracing. We're going to do, we're going to get an aggressive testing regime, and then we can go back to basically normal. And that, I would have thought that would have been feasible. And I now think in retrospect, that was obviously just never on the table for a bunch of political and institutional reasons. And given that, I probably would not advocate for nearly as much closure as I did. Well, I'm not an anarchist. A lot of people assume that if I don't like, say, price controls, I must want no government. I don't never understood that um, leap uh, that people make about me. I think there is a role role for government, um, but it, what's fascinating about your that comment you made, and then I'll, I'll let you have the last word, is that institutions struggle to work well when tribalism and partisanship run amok as they have, and you know leadership was missing there to try to pull people together. It's not Donald Trump's skill set, just the way it turned out to be. Um, I agree with you. I thought there'd be a little more unity wasn't in the cards. And I think we paid a terrible price uh, that certain things that should have been open and shut became virtue signaling or vice versa. Not doing it became virtue signaling. Um, it just, it's bizarre. Such a strange time. Such a strange time. 
Um, I think I would close by pointing by by saying something that look there. I've thought during this pandemic a lot about a quote from James Harriet, who people of my age and older will remember wrote these wonderful books about being a vet in the Yorkshire Dales. They're sort of lightly fictionalized mm -hmm. uh, accounts of his life as an actual vet in the Yorkshire Dales, and uh, you know some of the stories are made up, but a lot of them are true. And uh, you know he said he told tells a great story once about early very early on in his career he goes to watch this eminent horse specialist doing an operation and then the horse just randomly dies in the middle of the operation horses are, are quite my understanding is they they don't take anesthesia particularly well and so the horse dies and the, the <laughs> i guess the way at the time that you would try to um perform cpr on a horse was that you would jump on its ribs mm -hmm. and so he said as he watched this eminent specialist of whom he had been in awe dancing around on the horse's ribs Dead horse, yeah. he suddenly realized that his profession was going to afford many opportunities to look like an idiot <laughs> and indeed it did um and i think that that has been true of my own profession as well and, and more broadly the kind of commentator pundit wonk profession which is that at any given time in the pandemic, it's looked like you understood what the result was, right? So early on, you know, blue staters are looking enviously at Europe where everything's open and we're still basically closed because we never got the pandemic under control the way they did. I mean, they had, they, they dropped their cases very close to zero during the summer and we had not because red states just refused. Um, and, and, you know, for possibly for other reasons, you know, maybe the lockdowns in, in blue states even weren't as complete as they were in Europe. Um, but on the other hand, and so there was a lot of triumphant commentary and then came fall and Europe just zooms up and suddenly their caseloads are worse than ours. And all of a sudden red staters are turning around and going, ha ha ha, what do you think now, right? Um, and this has gone back and forth several times because then Europe got it back under control and we still haven't. Um, so, but I would say this is that I think now that we're coming to the end of it, right? We're, we're going to have a lot of our Maybe. population vaccinated. Maybe. We hope Maybe it looks like we're now at this moment. Again, I'm, I'm taking one of these opportunities to look like an idiot, <laughs> but, um, no, but that I think that one thing we can say is that Europe did better on the kind of control side. The controlling people side right they really did manage to get their caseloads much lower than the united states did and i think that that was policy i don't think it was I don't know. right i mean i or policy or culture whichever right it was something about us it wasn't just random luck of the virus there was something that we were doing either as governments or as individuals that was keeping transmission going at a pretty brisk clip during the summer i think part of that honestly does have to do with like you know, it was spreading in a lot of states where there's a lot of air conditioning and where it's really hot and so people were inside. Yeah. But the flip side of that um, is that we did better on vaccines than Europe and that Brexit's looking like genius at the moment, right? And so what does that tell you about these two cultures? I think it does tell you something. And I think it's, it is it is that America is actually better at, at the adaptation. We still are. We got a lot of problems. <laughs> we have so many problems. We are so divided. Um, but we still have this capacity that made us one of the, you know, the leading forces in World War II that has made us, uh, you know, a, a often indispensable nation uh, economically to the world. Um, we still have it, guys. We could do more of it. We could get it back. <laughs> um, we just have to stop screaming at each other. <laughs> My guest today has been Megan McArdle. Megan, thanks again for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.